You guys ready? We're going to continue through all in with the uh, energy and passion that I have had for the last few weeks. I got to tell you, the reason for it is I believe that all of us, myself included, needed a checkup on our hearts. Are we all in for the kingdom of God? Are we all in for the kingdom of God as God sees it, not as we see it? The struggle for me is to not wrestle control of everything. I'm one of those guys, if I ask you to do something and you don't do it, I probably won't say anything to you unless you're my employee. I'm just going to go behind you and do it. If you're my employee, I'm going to make sure you're watching me go behind and do it. <laughs> if they're cool with watching me do it, then I know I have a worthy adversary on my hands. So <clears throat> I want to start with a couple of, of uh, family items. Um, I didn't warn anybody that I was doing this, but if Ray and Lisa Schmidt, if you could stand up for me, I won't make you come up here, but if you could stand up. Uh, Ray and Lisa Schmidt are part of our VCF family, and today is their last Sunday here at VCF. They are going on a wonderful, exciting adventure, moving to the middle of nowhere, Utah, which is pretty much like all of Utah, right? We had dinner with them a, a few nights ago, and, and I could tell that there was that concern about uprooting, but there was so much excitement in the adventure. And so we just want you to know that wherever you land, wherever God leads you, wherever you travel, you are part of our family, and we love you, and we are praying for you. And we hope that you don't miss service online, even if you watch it a couple days later. But I am excited about your new church family, and uh, as you grow in them, then you know that we have a bigger church family now because you guys took our family to Utah. So thank you so much for who you are. I love you personally. We all love you, and we're all praying for you. So, all right. Ray has repented. A sinner no more. <laughs> now I'm going to do something that's very difficult for me. I need some help. Okay? Okay. You sure? Yeah. You don't even know what I'm asking. I'll do it anyway. All right, good. We received a heck of a deal and generosity on our first RV for BCF Means Home. Woo! Yeah! Jason found it. Yeah. I negotiated it. Woo! We have it. It is sitting outside. If you want to look at it, it's out the back door. It is not good looking. It is a 1967 26-foot Overland RV. I have to move it by Tuesday because it's awful looking out there. But here's the thing. Inside, sound. The electrical hookups work. We put a manometer on the gas test. We had it treated and tested for mold, both kinds. It's empty. There's nothing there. The worst thing that was inside was a wasp nest, which if you know me, meant that that was now a space where I did not belong any longer. <laughs> so we killed that so I could go back in. What I need is, is in the unloading of it, because we, we got it delivered, and, and thank you to the gentleman that towed it. If you need anything towed or moved, let me know. I will give you this guy's information. He is an awesome, very helpful individual. He knew he was doing this for a church. So he did about an $1,100 job for 300 bucks. And he brought that thing over on a trailer, pulled with his pickup truck. He's got a beast, right? The front passenger's tire popped off the rim. It broke off the bead. We actually had to park it, driving it on the rim. That tire has to be replaced with the spare that is on the back of it. And I'm being honest with you, I don't have time to do that until like Thursday. I won't even be here until Wednesday. So if one of you, mechanically inclined, and I would recommend two of you, have a jack, Jack it up, switch the tire. That would be very helpful for me. And it's back there, and it's unlocked, and the spare is on the back, and the key is in the office. So just, just do it. Don't, don't involve me. This is the point of asking for help. Okay? I will make, that, that I will make sure the key is very... As a matter of fact, I'll give the key to Rhiannon so you guys know who to contact. I will also be out of the office Monday and Tuesday. On Tuesday, I will be completely off the grid. If you text me, 
I will not. I'm, I'm doing more than do not disturb. So for those of you who know the trick to break my do not disturb, my phone's going to be off, y'all. Baby, use that gun. I just said it again. Okay. Okay. Happy Valentine's Day. Or happy you better spoil your wife day. Listen, let me, let me tell you, <clears throat> the romantic inclinations of the McDowell family did not increase this year. I found the perfect card, but it was in Seattle and it wasn't here. So I had my brother take a picture of it and text it to me, and, and I texted it to Crystal, and that's her Valentine's Day card. <laughs> For the record, I did try to find it locally first, but it was such the perfect card, and it had a little swear word in it, so I can't say it in church. But I basically told her she's an aw awesome wife, and she should really keep that up. That's exactly what the card says. Crystal and I have been together so long that every day is Valentine's Day, right, honey? OK, let's get started. I got a lot of information for you. I was in, um, in Kentucky. And, and I, I, any time that I went on a work trip, and for a few years, I was out of town a lot because I had to be trained, because I was a lighting specialist. And I was taking over a showroom that also sold appliances and plumbing. So I had to know about appliances and plumbing. And so the manufacturers agreed to send me on a two-year intensive training. So just about every month, I was flying somewhere in the country to a factory to be trained by a manufacturer. And there was a trip to Louisville to GE. And I had never been in Kentucky, so I fly in a day before and I fly out a day late so I can do a little sightseeing. And uh, I had never eaten at a Waffle House before. And I'm telling you, I have not eaten at a Waffle House since. If you've eaten in a Waffle House in the South, and you're not used to Southern cooking, you have bathroom issues that are not good on a corporate trip. And so I will not eat at a Waffle House again. But I found something very interesting. All of a sudden, I'm sitting there by myself, and all of a sudden, this conversation breaks out. And they're talking about God. And it's like a trucker, a regular, and a waitress. And they are having this amazing conversation about God, about how God exists, and you can see it in creation, and how God is the thing that we need to be talking about most. And, and you know, they were saying stuff like, I wish I knew more about this, and I wish I knew more about that. And I was sitting there thinking, I'm going to raise my hand because I, you guys have a, a God specialist in the house. How unique is this? And so I started to interject, and then the, the, the waitress, and I'm going to... Um, this is exactly how she sounded, okay? I know, y'all. I know, y'all. You know what really bothers me is when them Christians come in and they start telling us their opinion, they take over the conversation, they tell us that's the only way. That drives me nuts, y'all. <laughs> Spitting it. Like, if she was here, she'd be like, oh, my God, you sound just like me, right? She had a very deep southern accent. She was from Georgia, not Kentucky, and she had this opinion. And so I went like this. It struck me that this conversation was not a unique conversation. This is, if you, if you could be a fly on the wall to hear about people who are not involved in a church community discuss God, this would be a common conversation. On that exact same trip, I had to leave Louisville and go to Virginia, and I had to stop in Boston, which I don't know why. Okay? I, I know the United States map, and I feel like straight to Virginia made more sense, but we had to go to Boston. And on that flight from Boston to Boston, I was sitting next to a girl who was on her way to Harvard. And I was on my way to a bathtub factory, so, you know, we had that connection. <laughs> we talked about Jesus a little bit, and she was, like, so authentically and genuinely happy for me that I had Jesus in my life. But she said that I was crazy. Because no person in our educated society can still believe that today. She acknowledged the existence of God, but then told me I was crazy for believing that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, and that my life was released from the grips of sin as a result of my relationship with him. She called me crazy. She was starting college. I already have four degrees. Who is she? But you know what? It helps to hear that because she's not alone, right? 
is not alone. Imagine, if you will, that you come home from work one day, and in your mailbox, there's your regular mail, but there's also an ace of spades. Ace of clubs. An ace. This is a club. There's an ace. And on the ace is just an address. No explanation. Nothing. Nothing follows up. For days, you're wondering, what is this ace in my mailbox? What is this address? And it eats at you. And eventually, you go to the address, and you see a situation that common society today would normally just butt their nose right out of, right? You see, just picture something that you would not want to see, an abusive relationship, a person struggling with addiction, a person struggling with sexual promiscuity. And you have the one thing that can save them. Does the ace in your mailbox stay a mystery? Or does it become a mission? That is not an original story. That is from a story called I Am Messenger. It's a teen-level book written out of Australia. And the gentleman in that book received four aces. And in each one of those aces was a moment of redemption where he could execute what needed to happen for redemption to happen. And no, it's not a Christian book. It's a human book. If you received an ace with an address on it, very few of us would be able to just let it go. Am I right? We would have to know. And we'd have no answers or information, so we would have to go to that address. And all it took was an ace with an address in your mailbox. Think about that for a second. And you all know that you would need to know what was going on, right? What you were holding in that moment, what that ace was directing you to, was the cure for the common ailment of sin in the world. You, the vessel and messenger and hands and feet of a God who wants to be known by everyone. So I, that's where I want you today. I am putting an ace in your mailbox today. And I'm going to warn you, I'm not going to stop until I'm done. I cannot stop short and I can't cut anything out today. It would not do justice to the gospel of Jesus Christ and his word with which I'm preaching out of today. So if you have your Bibles with you, we are going to be in a few places in the book of Romans, starting with verse chapter 1. So if you want to open up to Romans chapter 1, and listen, you're going to hear this a lot. Ready? Listen, this is urgent. I cannot stress enough. As I come to points, I'm going to start with, listen, this is urgent. And I'm not wagging a finger at you, because everything that I'm saying to you, I am experiencing my life is irrevocably different today because of the message that God put on my heart today. I have been waiting to give this message for so long that you guys may have to throw stuff at me to get me out of here. Nothing sharp, please. I have to go on a date with my wife today. And don't hurt the moneymaker. Here's the thing. People do not have a problem believing in God. Hear that. People do not have a problem believing in God. That is not the issue that we have in the world. They have a problem with their options. They have a problem that if whatever option they're exploring isn't relevant to the current culture, then it isn't viable. If it does not relate to us today, it's hogwash and we move on. Can I just tell you, we are not a lot of different from biblical times other than we sleep on beds, roofs, no dirt floors, and we have technology. Those are things that surround people, not people. People have not changed much. We adapt. We live within the culture and society that we have landed in. Even the ones that don't appear like it, they're adapting in their own way. People who choose to be homeless, who have an income, but choose to be homeless, they're adapting in their own way. And we don't understand it, right? We, we, our biggest issue is we do not understand why people 
do things differently. And what we want is we want people to do things the way we do them because it works for us. If we did that, that ace in our mailbox would never have an impact on us. It would never have an impact on us. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 20. It would help if you'd mark the right page, Pastor. Were you a rookie? Starting with verse 18. <laughs> you can't be hard on yourself. My title on my Bible says, God's wrath against sinful humanity. So you know, get ready, because some body blows and an uppercut is coming. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth about their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain for them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. I mean, there's a really wordy thing to say. Because of creation, we know the existence of a creator. Even the evolutionists have submitted to the fact that a greater being than known had to have started everything. The evolutionists and the Big Bang theory, theorists, 90% of them have agreed that if the Big Bang happened, Keep in mind, a theory is a theory until it's true, right? So when we talk about theory, it's, it's just a thought, okay? But the relevant theory right now is God had to create the things that bumped into each other and had the Big Bang. So we do not get an excuse of what about people who've never heard of God? You will be hard-pressed to find a civilization that does not believe a creator exists. The backwoods tribes that always, be, always get brought into this conversation about ne the missionaries never have been there, they've never heard the truth. They may not know the truth of Jesus Christ, but they know a creator exists. That is the foundation because, listen, this is urgent. Everyone knows about God. Everyone knows about God. He has made it clear and he has revealed it to anyone with a pulse. So, how can Paul come to this conclusion? That, that everyone knows about God? Well, it, it's simple. First, creation, right? We see the majesty of God every single day. Every single day. And second, our natural Moral compasses. Before you even know that we're going to be talking about a God, you know right from wrong. You're born with knowing right from wrong. Your parents teach you because they knew it. That is not something that can just be brought up. Okay? It's got to be understood. God has given you a moral compass, and unless you can explain where else that came from, and if you say your parents, where did they get it from? Their parents, where did they get it from? Eventually, we're going to get to the point where somebody had to just have it. We know God exists. Lastly, atheism is a perfect example of knowing that God exists. Atheism is now a religion. It's one of the fastest growing religions. They're starting churches. They're worshiping their belief that there is no God in church. They're preaching messages about why God doesn't exist. If he doesn't exist, why put so much energy into it, man? If he doesn't exist, why did you start a church to talk about he doesn't exist? If he didn't exist, it wouldn't matter. Atheists are making the point that God exists with their own actions. Why hostily disagree with something you don't believe exists? 
We do not put effort and energy into things that don't exist logically or rationally. It's an irrational response. Keep in mind, clinically, if we believe something that we don't know is true and we act like it's fact, it's irrational. We can pursue it, we can investigate it, but we got to know. And the more we don't know, the more we open up options that we should not open up to ourselves. The biggest problem with, with why people reject God is the options, right? There's a religion that has created different levels of heaven depending on how bad you might have been, but there is no hell. There's only a reward for your life no matter how you live it. There are religions that believe you are a God and you will fulfill that promise when you die. Who doesn't want to be a God, right? Superhero movies and all of that stuff. We, we look at that and we're like, oh my gosh, I could be a God? Let's go. What are my superpowers, right? I have a superpower. I can walk away from people like that. It's awesome. Let's read that again. Same verse. Same, actually, I'm only going to read two of them, 18 and 19. God's wrath, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, let's just burrow into that for a second. What is Paul saying here? That we reject God by suppressing the truth of our wickedness, right? Let me tell you in very plain layman terms for you what that means. And just so you know, listen, this is urgent. All people have rejected God. All of us in this room and all of us outside of this room have rejected God. That point two. If you're keeping notes, you'll want to keep these points. So how can Paul come to, to that conclusion? Well, the desire to suppress the truth about God manifests itself in three ways. And it's simple. We seek other things more than we seek God. This is a common thing that we all do. I've seen it in ministry. I've seen it in myself. We get in a room, we're excited, we're planning a ministry, we're planning an event, we're planning on loving on people, and then all of a sudden, it's not going somebody's way, and they have to inject their will, and now we have chaos in a moment where we're supposed to be showing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do it. The leaders of the churches in this world do it. I am guilty of this. The next thing that we do is we turn to unbelief. We have an expectation of God. God doesn't meet that expectation. God can't possibly exist because he let me down. So that means your parents, your family, your friends, your job, all of them, none of them exist because we've all let each other down. We cannot hold God to a higher accountability than we are willing to hold human beings because God created us to be his instrument. God is a perfect target, a perfect whipping boy for your misfortune. And it leads to unbelief because we suppress the truth about God because he didn't meet our expectations. God does not exist to meet your expectations. You exist to meet his. This is so backwards. Our society is so backwards. We exist to meet God's expectations, and we all fall short of the glory of God and his expectations. Atheists exist today. And I got to tell you, one of my best friends in the world is an atheist, and we will sit and talk, and at the end I will always tell him, you believe in God more than you do because that two hours just proved it, dummy. That's the kind of friend he is. If I don't call him dummy, he'll think I'm mad at him. Some bromances are weird. We created atheism. You, me, Christians all over the world created atheism. Atheism did not sprout out of nowhere. And it is definitely not the creation of God, so it had to come from somewhere. So think about it for a moment. 
How many times have you seen somebody legitimately be harmed by the church? How many times have you seen somebody believe they were harmed by the church, but nothing was done about it? Each one of those critical moments led to the creation of atheism. We are way too obsessed with how these situations impact me, I, that we allow people to walk away losing an argument that didn't need to be an argument, but what we don't realize is, is by winning that argument, we cost the kingdom of God a soul. Being right is wrong. We have the truth of Scripture, and sometimes we wield it like a weapon that can't be controlled. And church, we have got to make a commitment that part of being all in is making this truth urgent. We are responsible. We may not be entirely responsible, but if your argument is, well, the other side does it too, you are denying the truth of God. Because it doesn't matter who's right. What matters is the kingdom of God and our role in it, not your feelings. I got to tell you, I am very willful person. I, am, I will control and dominate a conversation if you let me. I will also not be offended if you tell me to shut up. I am very difficult to offend. Ask my wife, how hard is it to offend me? Well, you could do it really easy. You know the buttons. That's not fair. I believe in constructive criticism, even if it's negative, because it's a part of our growth. If you ever tried something and weren't perfect at it, you had to suck at it first. And can I tell you that we are called to suck at life every now and then? Matter of fact, you're going to suck at life every now and then. Some of you more than others. And that's cool. Because if we're going to be broken, we might as well all be broken together, right? We are less broken when people are holding together our broken parts for us. BCF means family is not a catchy marketing phrase. I don't care if the world knows that we use that term. What I care is that people see it when they see us. Family is at the core of what God expects for us. On Valentine's Day, we have married couples who are just trying to get away from their kids for long enough to, you know, do stuff. Some of you are only looking for 10 minutes. Some of you are looking for three hours. Whatever. Good for you. My point is this. When we look at our family dynamic, are we looking at our relationships with the church and with the world and saying, does it look like a family? Family can say hard things together. Family can even have arguments that result in people not speaking for months or years, but they're still family. I have a cousin that would shoot me on sight. He hates me so bad. And if he needed a kidney, I'd be the first one testing for it because that's family. I just need to make sure he doesn't see me because he will shoot me. I love you, Kenny. He won't really shoot me, but it won't be a friendly exchange. I will repeat in layman's terms, religious people have created atheism. God did not come to create a religion. God called people of faith into action. He did not call us into a church setting where we can go and feel good about ourselves all week. He called us into action. The last words that he said resulted in a room filling up with the Holy Spirit that was represented in flames and a man who had death warrants on his head stepped out before a crowd and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ knowing that if he was alive today, there'd be six sniper rifles on him. And I bet you today, Peter steps out on the balcony the same way. To embrace the gospel is to embrace love, and love is the most dangerous thing we do. This is urgent. Listen. Point three. All of us, all people, are guilty before God. We have all fallen short of the glory and grace of God. 
We have all wronged him. We have all suppressed the truth. We have all sinned against the truth of God. All of us. That's why we needed the gospel. If just a few of us were doing it, God wasn't going to send his son to die for a few people. He sent his son to die for all people. All that ever was, all that ever is, and all that ever will be. He broke into time and broke it. We have all been guilty. So let me, let me give you, let me summarize those three points. I and mean, I don't just have three points, but bear with me. I am not watching the clock. So if I put this in two terms where the three points get combined, it would sound just like this. We are all guilty before God because we have all risked, resisted the rule and glory evident in creation. We are all guilty before God because we have resisted the truth seen with our own eyes every day in creation. The question you might be thinking right now, is it fair to condemn, to condemn someone that has not heard about Jesus? Of course not. I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about creator. I'm talking about Father God. We can't believe in Jesus unless we know God exists. But here's the truth about it, right? Once we're there, then we have to realize and accept and believe in the fact that Jesus is God. There's not three gods. Jesus is God. They are triune. That means they are intrinsically linked. They cannot be separated. If we're approached to understanding Jesus' role in the Trinity, let me just tell you, he is the Trinity. Don't confuse it. Don't beat it up. Don't over-discuss it. He is the Trinity. God the Father, the Creator, sent his only Son to die for us where he was resurrected and ascended to heaven. He sits at the right hand of God. But before he did that, he left the Holy Spirit as the great counselor behind so that he could be present in our life. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of Jesus. It's not some separate Spirit that draws us to him. It is him. Listen. This is urgent. This is urgent. I promised that. All of that is hard to hear. Well, gosh, thanks for kicking me while I was down all day. You want to go ahead and stomp on my head while you're at it, Pastor? Sure, let's do that. Here's the good news. <laughs> God knew this. So what did he do? He made a way. He knew we were all going to fall short. He knew we were going to suppress the truth. He knew we were broken people trying to exist in a broken world together in a broken way. So he gave us a way. Romans 3.21. But now, apart from the law, the righteous of God have been made known to which the law of the prophets testify. Continuing to 22. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. The righteousness is given by faith to all believe in Jesus Christ. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Listen, this is urgent. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. If you ever wanted to know why Christ took the cross, it is Romans 3, 24, 5. God presented. It was a gift. Presented means literally to offer without receiving. When we present our plan for something, we are giving it without needing anything in return. It's the same word as, it's a great core word. We receive the gift of, of how God made the way, right? So we receive the gift, and it's a gift. It's nothing that we can earn, and it's nothing that can be earned. Do not try and earn your way into heaven. You're going to end up earning your way somewhere else. It is redemption. It is literally redemption. Stress anxiety, all of those things are caused by unresolved stresses. You do not stress resolved issues. Anxiety is strictly from unresolved issues. So God has resolved 
the issue of grace. It's grace. It's something that you cannot pay for and you absolutely do not deserve. It's absolute grace. And the only thing we need to do with this information, the only thing is to believe it. That's it. And listen, this is urgent. People must hear the gospel to be saved. My last point, people must hear the gospel to be saved. The only way people can be saved from the life of sin is to know the gospel. If they don't know it, they can't believe it. And who is responsible for sharing the gospel? And if any of you are thinking, you are talking to me, eh, I'm going to lead, lend credibility in my closing to that thought, but I'm telling you what my job is, is to encourage and equip you to go out and do likewise. Let's close with, uh, let's close with one last piece of Romans. Romans chapter 10. And I know I ran long, but I promise you, it feels like it was worth it to me. Chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But now, but not all Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. I didn't add the of course they did. If you look, it's in your Bible. Of course they did. The address that is on your ace is yours to fill in. But just because it's blank doesn't mean you don't have a mission. Our mission is to dwell and worry and wonder about the ace we found in our mailbox. So much so that we have to act on it because we can't live with not knowing. If you had the cure to the most deadly virus illness that ever existed and you kept it for yourself, that's what it's like to not share the gospel. That is exactly what it's like. So let me close with this. In the Bible, the gospel never moves forward without human intervention. And hear that. A lot of you who believe in, in the absolute deity of God, good for you. But I am telling you that if God wanted to advance the gospel on his own, he never would have envisioned calling us to do it. Why would he call us to do it if he could do it himself? He's God. In the Bible, the, the gospel progresses through human messengers. People who took the ace and went to the address to see what God needs them to do. God is calling us into a world that has never needed him more. God is calling him into hurts and, and issues and things that, that are unimaginable for some of us. They're unimaginable. This is the mission that God has entrusted us with. Not just me, the pastor, not just the associate pastors, not just the upper, my bosses and their bosses and their bosses. No, no, those people... Our job is to equip you and, and, and try and motivate you to say, hey, this is so much bigger than you. Why wouldn't you share it? Why wouldn't you share it? Go tell it on a mountain. Go tell it in, in your bowling league, in the dugout of your softball league, in the stands of your little kid's little league game or dance recital. And you don't have to just approach them and say, you need to hear about Jesus Christ. I'm worried you're going to die. This is urgent. Listen. No, can I just tell you the best way to approach that is to gain a relationship with them, get to know them, and treat them like the family you are inviting them into. I suck 
at calling out people on the spot. Can I talk to you about Jesus? I, I have no comp. It doesn't work. I used to sell stuff. I've never been able to sell Jesus. Because for me, Jesus is an experience. And I want people to experience Jesus. Not just believe him. Not just believe in him. That's just step one. Experience the truth of what it means to have an ace delivered to your mailbox. I will promise to leave you with this. The most urgent message I could ever preach was this one. The most urgent. It's the most urgent message that you could ever possibly hear. So it's my prayer that you heard it the way God needed you to hear it. All I can do is throw words at you and hope. But I hope that you are, you're sensing my passion and my belief in what I'm saying. I'm not just saying this because I want it for you. I need it for me. I need this truth in my life more than I've ever needed it in my entire life. And I don't want any of you to experience anything other than the truth that has rescued me. If you want to know my heart, my heart is, I need this as much as you. But you need it, man. You need it. This is the most important message that you cannot afford to ignore. We cannot afford to ignore this. I can't afford to ignore it when God gave it to me, and you can't afford to ignore it because I gave you God's message. This is the most urgent message that our community, our friends, our family, our coworkers, neighbors, you get the point, right? It's the most urgent message that they don't even know they need to hear. But there is only one way to salvation and redemption. So what they need to hear is the truth of the gospel. The cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't have to be super religious. Please do not be a religious people. Be a people of faith whose lives show that. Your words show it. Your actions back up your words. Be a people of faith that you can honestly say that the truth of the fact that Jesus came and lived a perfect life, died on a cross in a miserable, horrible way, resurrected three days later to thousands of witnesses, spent 40 days on the earth preparing people to expand his kingdom by sharing the gospel. Everybody, that doesn't get talked about enough. Why was he there for 40 days? Because this was so urgent, he had to put 40 days into it, which is a significant number in scripture. It was so important. And then he ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of God where daily he prays for us, intercedes on our behalf. Because dang it, we need that. That's the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in that truth, we experience redemption and freedom from a broken life of sin. We are still broken, but we are part of a broken community that is way more whole than if you weren't. I'm not going to promise anybody riches or prosperity, or defeat of depression and anxiety, what I am going to promise you is the people of faith will make sure you don't experience that alone. You don't experience that alone. Yeah. Hey. I want to take a moment of silence as we close. Everyone can bow their heads. Close your eyes, please. Even if you are new or maybe aren't there yet, please, out of respect, close your eyes and bow your head. There's so many different ways to, to do this, but you guys are about to find out how long 30 seconds of silence is. I'm going to take 30 seconds of silence and then I will close. During that 30 seconds of silence, I want to seek your heart. I want you to seek your heart. I want to open it up to Jesus Christ, and I want you to open it up to God, and I want you to ask a question. Jesus, do I need to reaffirm myself to you? If so, let me allow you into my heart. And, and if you are one of those people, I want to encourage you to do that when we are praying. And if you don't know him, or you didn't know him like you know him today, and you want to experience that redemption, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. 
30 seconds of silence. you are one of those people that felt the gospel in your life today, and maybe you've already believed in and accepted him for who he is, but you need to reassert and reconfirm your commitment to him. If you would just pop your head up, your hands up, I mean. Thank you. If you are someone that does not know him and want to know him, I would encourage you to raise your hand. Thank you. All right, let's pray. If you are one of those people, I'm going to, let's just pray that first. Let's just pray that together as a family, as people come to know Christ, and we celebrate that today, Lord. Just pray that, say this simple prayer. Dear Jesus, I believe, I believe and accept in the truth of your gospel, and I receive it into my life today. accept the ace in my mailbox. I believe that what you did frees me and redeems me and adopts me into this family. We reaffirm our commitment to you. Every person in this room, myself included, Pray this prayer. I reaffirm my commitment to the truth and grace of your gospel and what it means to me, and I accept this ace in my mailbox today. And I accept my role in the brokenness of this world. Let us be a people of faith that can move mountains in your name. Thank you in your son's name. Amen. If you are one of the people who raised your hands, I want to encourage you. You will probably hear from me. Not probably, you will hear from me. But I would encourage you to gather up with somebody. Somebody you trust, somebody you know, maybe the person who invited you, maybe a member of your family, and let them know the commitment that you made today so they can be praying for you. Folks, we have four people who need to be, have prayers of protection over their lives right now. Because every time we do that, the enemy gets pissed, okay? Gets angry. And we are the only thing that can pray to protect that. Amen? Amen. Jesus will protect them if we're, in, if we're on board. Hey, happy, happy Valentine's Day. Um, I hope that, uh, well, I don't want to say anything like that. I hope that you guys have a wonderful day. And um, be in prayer. There's a lot of prayer needed in our, in our family right now. And uh, don't forget to pray for Crystal and I especially Crystal. She has to deal with me. Um, and have a great week. We'll see you soon.